Projectors, uh, we do need help. We want to be able to get a couple extra people involved uh, so that we can always make sure that we've got someone there in case of sickness or vacation or other situations that may arise. Uh, also, too, in the bulletin, I want to be sure to point out to you our weekly schedule. Uh, Mondays, every Monday, we have our weekly prayer meeting at 6.30 p.m. Uh, we get together and we pray and we seek God about the needs in this church and the needs on our island community. And we want to invite you to participate uh, because we need to pray. Uh, we need to pray and build this church on a foundation of the spirit, foundation of prayer. Uh, Wednesdays too, we have our adult Bible study at 6.30. We're currently studying through the book of John. And then also our team ministry, the Safe to Shore team ministry, meets at the same time, 6.30 p.m. <clears throat> uh, today, we have a sad day. Uh, we're going to be saying our goodbyes to uh, Alex Silva and uh, her daughter, Cassandra. Uh, Cassandra will be sticking around for a few weeks more. Uh, but, uh, from what I understand, the mess that has changed. Uh, but... Uh, Alex is going to be moving to Long Island, and they're going to be pursuing a whole new direction of life there. Uh, so we're going to be praying for them today. We wish them well. And for the ladies, just a reminder that in a few short months, we have the annual women's retreat in Rhode Island to look forward to. Uh, this is a very encouraging event. Uh, it's a great time to spend together as ladies of the church, connecting with the other ladies from all of the Assembly of God churches across the Southern New England Ministry Network. That's all the Assembly of God churches in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Uh, so we'd encourage you to attend. If you've never attended one of these events, I know that you will be blessed. Uh, please see Lee Griggs. There she is waving over there next to her handsome husband, Ed. <laughs> and uh, so if you have any questions at all, please see Lee. Uh, the earlier you can register, the better, uh, because we gotta make sure that we got the hotels booked, everything, you'll be able to take the church van, and uh, you can all go together to Rhode Island for that event. Uh, Island Food Pantry, as always, feel welcome to bring in some food items and put them down in the purple box in the hallway downstairs, and that'll all go to the Island Food Pantry to help those in need here on the island. And the Safe to Shore Team Ministry, uh, this Wednesday, they're going to have a craft time and a celebration night, and on the 21st, they're going to have a movie night with Christian comedian Tim Hawkins. So, some good stuff to look forward to in team ministry. Uh, so, why don't we stand together, and uh, we're going to have Tyler Paulson. He's going to come, and he's going to be leading us in the reading of God's Word. And he's going to be reading to us from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning at verse 18. <clears throat> and uh, then we're going to be praying. A uh, couple prayer, uh, more than a couple prayer requests. Uh, please keep Peter Pate in prayer. 
as he just had his gallbladder removed this past Monday. Uh, he came through the operation beautifully. He's at home resting. He has to take about three weeks to take it easy to recover. Uh, but the doctor said that they got to the gallbladder just in time uh, because he, it was just totally, I guess, destroyed with the amount of gallstones that he had in there. Also, to please keep Steve Soriano in prayer. Uh, once again, he's unable to be with us. He spent last night at the emergency room with severe bladder pain, and he's going tomorrow off-island to Falmouth Hospital uh, to have a Botox treatment done on his bladder uh, to try and alleviate the spasms uh, that he has that are so painful. Also, too, please keep Robert Romero in prayer. He's been quite sick uh, this week. Uh, he's had a fever and other symptoms going on, so we need to keep him in prayer as well. Okay. So, Tyler, why don't you come, and we're going to let Tyler lead us in the reading of the Word. Beginning at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 18. The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. As the scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish, since God in his wisdom saw to it that the world would never know him through human wisdom. He has used our foolish preaching to save those who believe. It is foolish to the Jews who ask for signs from heaven, and it is foolish to the Greeks who seek human wisdom. So when we preach, when we preach that Christ was crucified, the Jews are offended, and the Gentiles say it's all nonsense. But to those who called by, to those called by God to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. This foolish plan of God is wiser than the wisest of human plans, and God's weakness is stronger than the greatest of human strengths. Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes, or powerful, or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the world considered foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that are power powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all and use them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. God has united you with Christ Jesus. For our benefit, God made him to be wisdom itself. Christ made us right with God. He made us pure and holy, and he freed us from sin. Therefore, as the scripture, said, scripture says, if you want to boast, boast only about the Lord. Thank you very much, Tyler. And, uh, Tyler has been through Teen Challenge, and he is a living, breathing, walking miracle of God. Yeah. An answer to prayer. A testimony. Praise the Lord. And a fulfillment of prophecy, too. I'll never forget that night we had a, uh, a husband and wife uh, prophetic team here, and they called Donna up, and uh, they didn't know Donna or her history or situation, but they prophesied over her about her children and specifically about Tyler. And wow, you know, he had some troublous times, but then all of a sudden, God just did a work in his life. It's beautiful, beautiful. So let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, and we praise you today, for this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, we take a moment to pray for the service, that you would pour out the Holy Spirit upon us, and Lord, that you would pour us into the Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would just fill this place with the songs of your people, with the prayers of your people, and with your voice speaking into our hearts and our lives, causing your word to come alive in our hearts, O oh Lord. 
Father in heaven, for those who are weary in their souls, in their spirits, and in their bodies that need a reviving touch from you today, I pray, Lord, that you would give that reviving touch, that you would give that needed encouragement. Father, we pray too, Lord, for our brothers and sisters that are unable to be with us, for Dwayne and Donna, vote as they travel. For others, Lord, who may be away on vacation or work obligations, Father, we pray for Peter Pate as he recovers from this gallbladder surgery. We pray for complete healing in his body. We pray for strengthening in he and Amanda, Lord God, to help them through this difficulty and on to what you have for them in the future as they continue to follow you. Lord, we pray for our dear brother, Steve Soriano. Lord, as he deals with this constant issue with his bladder, Lord, we're asking you to go beyond medical capabilities and bring supernatural healing and deliverance to our brother Steve. Father, he needs help, Lord God. Lord, it seems to be just getting more and more difficult for him, so we're asking you to intervene miraculously for Steve. Lord, we pray for our brother Robert Ribeiro. We pray, Lord, that you would heal his body. Yes. Take this disease from him, Lord. Lord, you know how much in demand he is at this busy time of year with his work. Father, earning a living for his family. So we're asking you, Lord, to bring healing to his body. Father, we ask, Lord Jesus, for those who may have been drifting away from you, Lord God, and have become a little scarce at times, Lord Jesus. I'm not talking about those who are working or on vacation, but those who have gotten caught up with life. Father, I pray that you would speak to them in a special way and draw them back. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Let's worship the Lord together, church. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's funny that Pastor prayed that because I prayed that for myself this morning. Not to get bound with all the things of the world because there's always going to be something to distract you. But put God first and keep Him there. Amen. And he will direct your day. He'll direct your path. He'll direct your life and keep you. Amen? Amen? Amen. So let's go before the Lord with, with praise. And I'm going to come on. He is our fortress. He is our butler. He is our healer. Amen? Come on. The sun is shining. Hallelujah. Our God is greater than all your issues and all your circumstances.
Hallelujah, our God. Not my God, your God, but our God. Our God. Our God. He is so awesome. He is so precious. He loves us so much. He's just reminding us that, hey, I'm here for you. No matter what the problem, no matter what the issue, our God is greater. Our God is healer. So right now we stand in the gap for our brothers and sisters that are sick in body, but strong in spirit. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. 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 We magnify you, God.
He rose and conquered the grave. He healed. He walked on water. If he can do that, if he can do that, I know he can handle our issues and problems. All we have to do is give it to him and don't take it back. That's the key. Give it to him and leave it at the feet of Jesus. Amen.
step out of your seats and come together as a church body, as a body of believers around this altar. And let's worship God together. Let's experience what God has for us today. Allie's going to continue to lead us in worship, but these altars are completely open for you. We can fill it in. We can pack it in. It's beautiful. We can see God together as a church. Hallelujah.
you hear that word, church? That was God reminding us through our sister that He hears our cries. He hears our prayers. And I don't know about you, but I needed to hear that one today. Thank you, Lord. Because I've been praying for some things in my own personal life. And it's been like, God. And I've been waiting for that answer, you know. And there's God reminding us that He hears. He hears our cries. Wow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I pray that that word today was a ministry to everyone here who came in today where you've been a little heavy in your heart, you've been weary in your soul, and you've been praying, you've been seeking God, and you've been really starting to wonder, is it really worth it? Boy, God met us today. Praise the Lord. God is good. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, church. You may be seated. God bless you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I want to ask our uh, deacons who are with us today. Uh, looks like two of our deacons are away. Uh, but Suzanne and Nilma. If uh, Suzanne and Nilma, if you could come up front. And uh, my wife's going to join us up front as well. And I'm uh, going to ask Alex and Cassandra to come up front as well, too. sad when we have to say goodbye to partners in this church. We're looking at two people who have given a lot to this church. Yes. Who have a gift of service and of helps and who have poured themselves into the welfare of Vineyard Assembly of God. We want to take a moment to pray for them uh, but before we pray we wanted to I'll present you with a special gift from the church. Uh, that's to kind of help you on your way to Long Island. And uh, so God bless you from all of us. Praise the Lord. We're going to pray. And I'm going to ask if both Suzanne and Nilma can pray for Cassandra and Alan. Sabemos que Tu és fiel, Senhor, para com as nossas vidas, ó Deus. Não merecemos, Senhor, mas o Senhor é fiel. E eu creio, Senhor, que a Tua Palavra será, Senhor, assim feita e cumprida na vida dessas duas jovens, ó Pai. A Palavra diz, Senhor, que os passos do homem vão, eles são seguidos pelo Senhor e eles se deleitam no caminho. Senhor, que Tu possa, Senhor, abençoar essa família, Senhor. Só possa acercar as suas filhas com a tua graça, com o teu amor, com o teu favor, com onde ela colocar a planta dos pés e a palma da tua mão. Senhor, possa abençoar, prosperar, Senhor, em nome de Jesus, Senhor. Que as portas, Senhor, e as janelas e as comportas do céu se abrem, Senhor, e abençoe elas, Senhor, onde elas estiverem, Senhor. É o que nós pedimos em nome de Jesus. Amém.
let's give Alex and Cassandra a hand, not because they're leaving, but because we bless them and we love them. Praise the Lord. God bless you. God bless you. Would you want to say a few words to the church? I just want to say thank you for making us a part of your family. A long, long time ago when we got here, we didn't know anybody, and the church really took us in. So thank you for your love, your support, your friendship. We're going to miss you all very, very much. Thank you. God bless you. Praise God. Let's have the children come forward to be dismissed for Children's Church. Uh, what we'll do is uh, we will receive the offering at the end of service. Because I, I do, I want to get to the message today. But we want to take a moment and just ask if anyone's here, and this is your very first time in Vineyard Assembly of God, uh, we have a very special gift that we'd like to give you. Would you just raise your hand if this is your first time in Vineyard Assembly of God? Okay, looks like everyone's been here at least once. You just want the gift, right? <laughs> All right, let's pray together, okay? All right. Everybody ready to pray? All right. Are you looking forward to going back to school? Are you? You are? You like school? Do you like school? Yeah. Yeah? How about you? You like school? Yes? Anybody else like school or no? You'd rather stay home. Would you rather stay home? Yeah. Me too. <laughs> You like school? All right. Okay, we're going to pray now, all right? Heavenly Father, thank you for these children, Lord. And I pray that you would bless them, give them a blessed ending to their summer, a special few weeks before school begins. And Lord, I pray that your blessing would be on these children as they prepare to go back to school. Lord, I pray that you would help them to find good friends in school, friends that would lift them up and that they would be able to lift up and not the friends who would tear them down. Lord, we pray your touch to be with their parents and with their teachers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Right down to class. God bless you. us, would you turn with me in your Bibles to Psalm 128, as we're continuing our series, A Journey into the Presence of God, looking at Psalms 120 through 134, all of them titled, A Song of Degrees, or A Song of Ascents, because all of these were the songs that the ancient Israelites would sing as they walked and journeyed toward the temple in Jerusalem to meet with and to worship God. So Psalm 128, and I'm reading from the New International Version, it says, A song of ascents, blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to him. You will eat the fruit of your labor, Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Yes, this will be the blessing for the man who fears the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you live to see your children's children. Peace be on Israel. The title of the message today is A Better Life. 
a better life. Amen. Would you join me in prayer for this message? Father in heaven, Lord, as we come together as your body to worship you and to fellowship with each other and to encourage one another and to minister one another to one another, Lord, we need to be ministered to. We need encouragement from you today in a special way. So I'm asking you, Lord, to take this message, the thoughts and the words that I've prepared, and enable me to preach it and to teach it according to your ways, according to your anointing. Father, help your people to hear your word and let it be a part of their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 A better life. You know, as I prepared this message and thought about it, the thought occurred to me that it is in our nature as human beings to want and to pursue a better life. Countless immigrant families, many of you are here today, left your homelands and came to this country in the hope of finding a better life. My own ancestors came from Poland and Germany and Austria. They came to America looking for a better life. Liz's ancestors came here about 400 years ago from England looking for a better life. And some of you are here today. You've come from Brazil. You've come from Romania. You've come from Colombia. You've come from Jamaica. You've come from Ghana looking for a better life. And business and marketing have tapped into this primal desire that we have to seek for a better life in order to market their products and services to us. I looked up a few different products online and found a few that target this idea of a better life in some way. There's Viv, and their line is, we've curated the best services and products to make your life better better. Then there's Bed Bath & Beyond. Through Bed Bath & Beyond you can purchase Better Life natural cleaning products. As if a shampoo is going to magically give you a better life, right? <laughs> then there's Achieve Now a Better Life, an online seller of self-development ebooks. There's a Dove hair dye commercial that promises that dyeing your hair will make your life more vivid. Apple in 2017 launched a campaign titled, Life is Easier with an iPhone. I don't know about you, but my life isn't easier because of technology. You know, there may be a little bit more with convenience and a little bit more that you can do, but as far as making your life easier, it isn't. Because now all of a sudden you've got to worry about being hacked, you've got to worry about viruses, and so you've got to buy this, you've got to buy that product, and then of course what you bought yesterday is obsolete tomorrow, and you need an upgrade or something else, so it doesn't help me at all. But I believe that every human being has this desire for a better life because we instinctively know that the life that we have in this world isn't what it's supposed to be. I believe that knowledge is in every human being's heart. That somehow we intuitively know that this life is not what it is supposed to be. I mean, look at us. We crave perfection, but we live in a world of imperfection. We crave justice, but we live in a world of injustice. We crave love, but we live in a world of indifference, greed, and hate. We crave unending happiness, but we live in a world of passing happiness. We crave eternity, but live in a world of temporary. But God promises to those who believe in Him, those who reverence Him, those who love Him, God promises a better life. And I didn't hear one amen. 
Are you just too shocked by this? Or are you waiting for the boot to drop in this message? That somehow you get the better life if you give all your life savings to the church, you know? And, you know, and those kind of things. No, this is not going to be one of those type of messages. Because I'll tell you honestly, in this fallen, sin-filled world, it won't be a perfect life. It won't be a pain-free life. It won't be a problem-free life. But it will be a better life following Jesus. Amen. Psalm 128 verse 1 says, Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to Him. I want to share with you this thought from verse 1. That every follower of Jesus receives the promise of a better life. Everyone who follows Jesus has a promise of a better life. What did Jesus say in Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30? Let's have a little refresher right now. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and have been burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble at heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I don't know about you, but that sounds to me like the promise of a better life. And it is, and it is a promise. But we have to grow up a little bit and realize... That it, is an un that it is a conditional promise. It's conditional upon our faith. It's conditional upon our con belief in God. Our continuing obedience of faith. And by the way, faith isn't an attitude. Faith is a belief that leads to action. It says, blessed are all who fear the Lord and who walk in obedience to Him. You see, we can't say that we completely fear, that we reverence God, if we're deliberately living in a disobedience to Him. Right? If we're deliberately living in disobedience to God, then we can't say that we completely reverence Him. And this is why, by the way, so many of the promises in the Bible are conditional upon our obedience of God. Let me give you some examples. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 through 15. Jesus said, If you forgive other people when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins... Your Father will not forgive your sins. That sounds pretty conditional to me. How about John 15, 14? Jesus said, You are my friends if you do what I command. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. How about Revelation 3.20? Here Jesus is speaking again and he says, Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. All of those wonderful promises in the Bible, yet all of them are conditional. Conditional upon us, we, acting in faith. But for everyone who reverences God, and who demonstrates that reverence through obedience of God, guess what? There is a promise of blessing. 
that's what Psalm 128 verse 1 says. Blessed are all who fear the Lord, who walk in obedience to Him. Why? Because if you're fearing God, if you're reverencing God, if you're honoring God, if you're loving God, if you're living for God, in obedience to God, all of those conditional promises go in effect. And you're blessed. In fact, the Hebrew word blessing here is the Hebrew word ashra, and ashra literally translated, literally means happiness. That's what it means when the Bible says blessing or blessed or blessedness and all those variations of the word blessed. In the Hebrew, it literally means happiness. How many of you saw the 2006 movie, The Pursuit of Happiness, starring Will Smith? If you haven't, it's a powerful movie. It's not a Christian movie, but it's still a powerful movie because Will Smith portrays the real life Chris Gardner. Chris Gardner was a man in the 1970s. He was struggling in business and he saw a man in a Ferrari with a really nice suit one day, and he went up to the guy and asked him, what do you do? And the guy says, well, I'm a stockbroker. And he asked him, how do you get your kind of job? And Chris Gardner went on this journey of learning how, through a six-month internship, how to become a stockbroker. And during that time, his wife had left him, and he and his son actually were homeless, and at times had to sleep in the bathroom of a subway station while he was going to this high-end brokerage company to do this internship. He, Chris Gardner says, and uh, Will Smith voices these words, he says, it was right then that I started thinking about Thomas Jefferson on the Declaration of Independence and the part about our right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I remember thinking, how did he know to put the pursuit part in there? That maybe happiness is something that we can only pursue and maybe we can actually never have it, no matter what. How did he know that? That's somebody who is not a Christian commenting about happiness and realizing that in this life, all you can ever do really is pursue happiness. And right now, all over this world, no matter what country, what standard of living people may have, people all over the world are desperately pursuing happiness and never finding happiness because happiness only exists as a blessing that comes from reverencing, believing, following, and loving God through faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Pursuing happiness in work, in money, in food, in sex, in religion, in drugs, in hobbies, in work, in possessions, in influence, in power, in fame, in family, in relationships. People do that all the time, but all of them ultimately fail to produce lasting happiness. What is happiness? What is real happiness? Happiness, real happiness, is God-given joy and contentment and peace that exists apart from our circumstances. That's what real happiness is. Because if you tie your happiness to your circumstances, your happiness is going to come and go like the wind. Now, I mean, you can go out and to you know, you've saved up money, you've worked hard because you want to go to this five-star chef-owned premier restaurant and treat yourself to an absolutely extraordinary meal because you're a foodie. And you go and you have this wonderful experience and you eat this meal, but then the meal is done. And now 
If you want that meal again, you've got to work another six months to save up enough money to go do it again. But maybe you walk out from that restaurant thinking, oh, what a wonderful meal, what a great experience. And you get to your car and you find a parking ticket on your car. All of a sudden, all that happiness from that meal evaporates in a moment. We cannot tie our happiness to our circumstances. It has to come from God. Let's look at verse 2 now of Psalm 128. Actually, verses 2 through 4. It says, You will eat the fruit of your labor. Blessings and prosperity will be yours. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine within your house. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Yes, this will be the blessing for the man who fears the Lord. What are these verses talking about here? These verses are talking about potential. Because not only does every believer in Jesus receive the promise of a better life, every follower of Jesus receives the potential of a better life. The moment you became a follower of Jesus Christ, whenever that was, however long ago or however recent that was, your life from that moment on became a life of unmitigated potential. Yes. You have incredible potential right now as a, as a follower of Jesus Christ, as a son or daughter of the living God. Potential to grow closer to God as your father and friend. Potential to serve God and others in the church. Potential to hear the call of God into ministry. Potential to be free from life-controlling sins and addictions. Potential to break away from damaging patterns of thinking and living that you learn from your parents. Potential to receive guidance and direction from the Holy Spirit that will lead you into a destiny that is specific specifically tailored, designed by God just for you. Amen. So what is potential? Here's the definition. Potential is having or showing the capacity to become or develop into something in the future or latent qualities or abilities that may be developed and lead to future success or usefulness. That's what potential is. That there's something there. That the moment you became a believer in Jesus Christ, Jesus comes into your heart and life, God revives your spirit within you, and you receive now the potential to be everything that God wants you to be. Let me talk to you about potential. 74 years ago, on August 6th, 1945, the United States during the end of World War II destroyed the Japanese city of Hiroshima with an atomic bomb. That bomb carried 140 pounds of uranium. But that bomb was incredibly crude and inefficient, so scientists have later calculated that only 9 grams of that 140 pounds of uranium actually fissioned and detonated in that nuclear explosion. The rest of the uranium just got blown apart and scattered all over the place. But what is nine grams of uranium? What is nine grams? Have you ever held three pennies in your hand? Three pennies is approximately nine grams. Nine grams of uranium, three pennies worth of uranium, had the potential energy to destroy a city and kill over a hundred thousand people in a moment. That's incredible potential. 
When you look at human lives, I've been reading a biography of our sixth president, John Quincy Adams. When he was born, he's just an ordinary baby. But he had all kinds of potential. And through strong educational influences from his parents, John Adams and Abigail Adams, he learned, he mastered the English language. He learned Latin, Greek, French, and German. He went on to become a senator. He went on to become an ambassador to Great Britain. He went on to become an ambassador to Russia. He went on to become an ambassador to the Kingdom of Prussia at the time. He went on to become a Secretary of State. He went on to become the sixth President of the United States. He went on to become a member of the House of Representatives. And he became a very famous orator in his time. All from a little baby. Potential. The moment you begin a believer in Jesus Christ, you got more potential than nine grams of uranium. You got more potential than John Quincy Adams, who was arguably one of the most intelligent men who has ever been President of the United States. You got more potential than Albert Einstein. You got more potential than anyone you can think of, because, but that potential can only be realized by reverencing God and walking in obedience to Him. Because it says He will eat the fruit of your labor. In other words, God will make sure that your life, your efforts, your sacrifices, your service will not be wasted. Praise God. Praise God. One of the most tragic things is for someone to realize that they've wasted their life. I found in uh, the Elite Daily, November 7th, 2014, they were, in this article, they quoted a post written by John Jerryson. And John Jerryson is just, he posted this about his life. And these are some excerpts. It was a long article, uh, but these are the excerpts, the key ones. John Jerryson wrote, I'm a 46-year-old banker, and I've been living my whole life the opposite of how I wanted. All my dreams, my passion, gone. In a steady nine to seven job, six days a week, for 26 years. Today I found out my wife has been cheating on me for the last 10 years. My son feels nothing for me. My father passed away 10 years ago. I was getting busier and busier, on the verge of a big promotion. I kept putting my visit off, hoping in my mind he would hold on. He died, and I got my promotion. I haven't seen him now in 15 years. I regret letting my job take over my life. I regret being an awful husband, a money-making machine. <laughs> That's somebody only 46 years old. That's only one year older than I am. Who, when they were young, bought into the belief that the more money, that money was the key to happiness, that success in your career was the key to happiness. And this person at a very young age achieved all of those benchmarks. And then by the time they reach 46 years old, they're looking at their life and saying, I've wasted it. I had potential, but I just turned myself into a money-making machine and he's realized there's no happiness. God promises that if you follow Him, if you pursue Him, if you learn to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, and with all of your strength, 
He will make sure that however your life plays out circumstantially in this world, that He will make sure that it will not be wasted. That in that day in eternity when our works are tried with fire before Jesus Christ, that our works are going to pass through and there's going to come out on the other side gold and silver and precious stones. That somehow God is going to make sure that the things you do, the life you live is going to matter and count not just now, but for eternity. Amen. And that's a miracle of God. Psalm 128 goes on to say that blessings and prosperity will be yours. In Hebrew, those words literally mean happiness and well-being. Blessings and prosperity, happiness and well-being. And you know, in the Hebrew, the original Hebrew, it goes far beyond the Western idea of blessings and prosperity being material and financial. Happiness and well-being speak about the deeper aspects of spiritual and psychological health. God is interested in you. Think about this proverb. Proverbs chapter 15, verses 15 through 17. Here's God's point of view on our life. It says, all the days of the oppressed are wretched, but the cheerful heart has a continual feast. Better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. Better a small serving of vegetables with love than a fattened calf with hatred. You know, th that advice kind of runs counter to how we're trained to think as Westerners, isn't it? We're trained to think, no, no, hey, no. If I could just get the job, if I could just get the money, then everything would be happy for me. But God looks deeper and he wants to see you truly happy, truly in well-being, in your mind, in your spirit, in your heart, in your soul. And he promises that if we walk in obedience to him. Blessings and happiness will be yours. Happiness and well-being. Praise God. It says, your wife will be a fruitful vine within your house. Now, though this is written from a male viewpoint, the reverse is also implicit in the Hebrew. So you could just as easily say, your husband will be a fruitful vine within your house. Think about that imagery a little bit there. Great vines in the ancient world were planted to provide shade and fruit and both in an arid, hot climate brought refreshment. There was nothing better in the ancient world to go sit under the shade of a thick grape arbor and be able to reach up and pick your own grapes and just eat them right then and there. Refreshment. What else did they do with grapes in the ancient world? They would take grapes and they'd make them into wine. And what did they do with that wine? They added the wine to their water and the alcohol in the wine purified the water so that they could drink the water. Because back then they didn't have nice sophisticated filtration systems and, you know, and city water. You had water that mm, you didn't quite know where it was coming from. Water would often make you sick. So they would add a little bit of wine to the water. The general rule of thumb was one glass of wine to three glasses of water. And they'd mix it together and it allowed the germs to be destroyed. Think about a godly marriage then. It'll provide refreshment to you and it will provide the boundaries of purity for you in your life. Your children will be like olive shoots around your table. Olive shoots are cuttings taken from a parent tree and planted so that they grow. That's all it is. 
That's all olive shoots are. Olives are one of those trees where at certain times of the year, you can literally cut a branch off, stick it into wet ground, and it will root out of that branch and become a new tree. In fact, they recently did a study of some of the ancient olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane outside of Jerusalem. They tested three of the trees and they were able to get a sample of wood from the interior of these three trees and they carbon dated that wood and they found that those trees had started growing back in the 12th century. And they DNA tested those trees and found that all three trees were genetically identical. Meaning that they were cuttings from the same parent tree back in the 12th century. Somebody went and took three branches off a parent tree, stuck them into wet ground, and grew those three olive trees. Isn't that amazing? So the idea is that when your children are like olive trees around your table, it's like that expression, they're a chip off the old block. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they're able to continue what you have. And some of us are blessed with physical children. But even if you're not blessed with physical children, every Christian, every Christian can be blessed with spiritual children. What are spiritual children? They're other Christians that we can pour our hearts and lives and love into and watch them grow as fruitful followers of Jesus Christ. That's what Paul considered Timothy. 1 Corinthians 4.17, I won't read the whole thing, but we can pop it up on the screen. Paul writes to the Corinthians and says, I have sent you Timothy, my son, whom I love. Over and over again, Paul always refers to Timothy as my son. Timothy was Paul's spiritual boy, his spiritual child that he poured himself into and watched grow into a great man of God himself. So church, your life does not have to end up looking like Jerry Jerison's or John Jerison's that I just read a few moments ago. You have the potential from Jesus and in Jesus and through Jesus to live a better life. Yes, this will be the blessing of the man who fears the Lord Amen. or woman who fears the Lord. Psalm 128, verses 5 through 6 says, May the Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you live to see your children's children. Peace on Israel. <clears throat> That's a prayer. This psalm ends with a prayer. So number three, every follower of Jesus Christ receives not just the promise of a better life, not just the potential for a better life, but you receive a prayer for a better life. Now, we don't know who wrote Psalm 128. What we do know is that some believer, almost 3,000 years ago, wrote these words and prayed this prayer for you. Amen. Isn't that incredible? It says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, that all Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped to every good work. All Scripture is inspired by God. God-breathed. So this passage here, Whoever wrote this 3,000 years ago, when they wrote this, they were being led by the Holy Spirit to put this prayer down, to pray this prayer, and through the Holy Spirit, that prayer has gone out and affected the life of every single Christian, every single believer in God who has been alive and who will yet live in the future. That amazing? That is incredible. So if God inspired this prayer to be prayed, you better believe God's going to answer it. May the Lord bless you from Zion. Zion 
was the name of the mountain that the temple was built on in Jerusalem. So the name Zion became synonymous with the temple, just like how we refer to our government as Washington, or the British government as London, you know, or e even, you know, the Russian government, we can say, you know, and the Kremlin <laughs> has made this decision, and the name becomes synonymous with something else. So in the Bible, when you see the name Zion, think the temple in Jerusalem. Now, before Jesus died on the cross for us, the temple in Jerusalem was the one place where you could go to meet with God and have your sins forgiven. In other words, to the ancient Israelites, the temple was the center of their salvation. So when this is saying, may the Lord bless you from Zion, it's saying, may God bless you out of the center of your salvation. Where is our salvation? Our salvation is in our personal relationship with Jesus Christ. So God is praying here, may God bless you out of the very center of your salvation, your personal faith in Jesus Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verses 2 through 3 says, My goal is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love, so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding, in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Everything that you have, that I have, that we have together as Christians flows out of Jesus Christ. It all comes from Jesus. So may God bless you today out of Jesus Christ out of the center of your salvation. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May you live to see your children's children. Peace on Israel. I like that because it tells us that God is never just concerned with us in the now. He is also concerned, and we should be concerned too, about our future legacy. You know, church, one of the most selfish moments in the Bible came from a believer in God. This most selfish moment of the Bible came from the otherwise very godly King Hezekiah. When told by the prophet <clears throat> that the Babylonians were going to come and were going to destroy the kingdom of Judah and were going to destroy Jerusalem and were going to destroy the temple and were going to bring the survivors of the people into captivity in Babylon and that was going to become because of Judah's sins. King Hezekiah says to the prophet after hearing that word, the word of the Lord that you have spoken is good. Now would that be a reaction if somebody who had a true prophetic ministry came up to you and said, God is going to level your house, wipe out your savings and finances, and leave you with absolutely nothing? And you're going to have to go work in Uganda? Would you stand there and say, well, the word of the Lord is good. Why did Hezekiah say that? Well, the Bible explains. It says Hezekiah said that because he thought, will there not be peace and security in my lifetime? Because the prophet had told Hezekiah, this judgment is going to occur after you are dead. And Hezekiah said, oh, this is a good word because it's not going to affect me. But he's not thinking about his children and his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren. All he's thinking about is himself. He's got no concern about his legacy. And you know, that's our human nature. 
We like to only think about the now. Let me give you some examples. The current national debt of the United States is almost $22.5 trillion. And that's from the United States government's debt clock. That's not somebody coming up with this figure out of the air. This is from the U.S. government saying, hey, we're up to $22.5 trillion in debt, and it's still going. And you know what? There's no plan to repay it. No idea. Nobody knows. It's only thinking in the now. How about another one? The United States currently has 90,000 metric tons of nuclear waste stored above ground. I have no idea what to do with it. No plan. The Pilgrim Power Plant that's being shut down, not that far from here, by the way, it has on site huge containment casks filled with nuclear waste. I have no idea what to do with it. No idea. And if you say, well, there's that mountain in Nevada that they've hollowed out tunnels and they're going to put it all there. You know, they talked about doing that in the 1980s and it's been held up and delayed in bureaucracy in the courts and the government still hasn't built it. Despite what they show on the Godzilla movie. It's not there. It doesn't exist. It's only thinking about the now. No thought about the legacy. The Constitution of the Iroquois Nation instructs its leaders to look and listen for the welfare of the whole people and have always in view not only the present, but also the coming generations, even those whose faces are yet beneath the surface of the ground, the unborn of the future nation. That's an idea of looking forward to a legacy. Paul says this to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 2. He says, You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. In those two verses of scripture, four generations are mentioned. Paul taught Timothy, and Paul told Timothy, teach other people who will then be able to teach other people. That's about a legacy. In other words, a better life is not lived by consuming all of God's blessings on your now, but by learning how to pass those blessings on to future generations so that they can live a better life too. So parents, don't forget to pour your faith into your children. You can't force them to believe, but you can teach them about what you believe. Brothers and sisters in the church, don't just come to church to get your weekly fill of Jesus and then go on with your life. But come to church, get your fill of Jesus and pour it into somebody else. Amen. See, church, every follower of Jesus receives three things. The promise of a better life, the potential of a better life, and a prayer for a better life. You put all that together, church, you've got a better life. Amen. We've got a better life. We just got to step out and begin to live it by faith. By faith, again, isn't a vague thing. It's an action. Let's stand together.
Let me pray over your church as we go today. And then give, you a moment, give Liz and I a moment to get to the back door so we can greet you on the way out. And also to ushers, if you could be ready, we'll receive our tithes and offerings. As you go out, you can just, if you have your tithe or offering, you can just drop it into the little pouch that the ushers have. Heavenly Father, you've called us today to have a better life. Yet many of us were not living a better life. Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help us to step out in faith and just simply obey you and follow you, love you first. And Lord, we know that you will carry us through the painful parts of this life in this fallen world, through the difficult parts of life in this fallen world. But regardless of those things, Lord, ultimately, we know that you will give us a better life. A life of hope, a life of promise, a life of purpose that goes beyond just simply earning a living, raising children, and then retiring, and then being buried in the ground. But Jesus, 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 I pray, God, that your hope, your faith, will speak against the hopelessness that is in our culture today. And that your people will not allow themselves to be consumed by careers, by finances, but rather we would allow ourselves to be consumed by you, Jesus. So fill us full of your spirit, Lord. Strengthen us as we prepare to go about our lives today, tomorrow, and over the next several days until we gather together again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 God bless you. Liz and I, we love you very much.